Montgomery was the kind of author who wrote what she knew. She transformed the beloved town of Cavendish into Abigail. Having lost her mother as a toddler and been abandoned by her father, she created one of the world's most beloved orphan characters. And she grew up like Anne in a farmhouse surrounded by apple orchards. She used her bucolic, quasi-tragic Canadian childhood as inspiration for her prolific work. And she also used some other strange shit from her youth to cover stories. <laughs> now, when Montgomery was a child, she read a headline in the newspaper declaring that THE Judgment Day had arrived. And for a whole 24 hours, she suffered in silence as she awaited the apocalypse in the mouth of hell that is surely Prince Edward Island. <laughs> I can only assume that the only thing to arrive at its shores that day was a bitter cold breeze whistling, I'm sorry, and I'm <laughs> healthcare. <laughs> she later dramatized this childhood memory in her novel, The Story Girl. Now, if you had your TV set permanently fixed on the Disney Channel as a kid, work as the basis for Avonlea, which starred a preternaturally looking Sarah Polly. Now, the story girl is about a group of cousins who get into the kind of mischief that only a summer in rural maritime provinces can offer. <laughs> so there's lots of passages about rummaging through the forest and fighting over apple picking. Yet within this wholesome depiction of the tween years, there are two chapters that stand above the rest. And these are the Judgment Day chapters. So here's a brief summary of what happened. Cousin Felix runs over to the group holding the Charlottetown Daily Enterprise for all to see. And the headline reads, the last trump will sound at 2 o'clock tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and it informs that an American cult leader has predicted the end of times. And a cloud of horror descends over the kids. Peter decides to read the Bible as a way to redeem himself from years of wishy-washy religious sentiment. Bitchy Felicity lets go of her grudge against her cousin and lifts her vow of silence. Cecily cannot stop whining and crying. Beverly regrets all the asshole moves he's made in his short life, maybe because he's avoiding Beverly. <laughs> Sarah, the story girl of the title, thinks wistfully of all the things she won't be able to experience. They all wonder why the grown-ups are so chill. They question the veracity of the article, but determine that if it's in a newspaper, it must be true. And they spend a whole night oscillating between fear and selfless solace, denial, honest self-reflection. The following day, they gather in a field to bear witness to Earth's final moments. But two o'clock comes and goes. Now, do they rejoice at the relief of having avoided total annihilation? Not really. They shrug. They swear never to believe in newspapers again. <laughs> and they go pig out on teas and scones. <laughs> Now, this little snippet of a novel might appear like a cutesy description of the innocence of babes, but to me, it is one of the most accurate accounts of human nature in any work of literature, and I will fight you. <laughs> <laughs> it is definitely more telling than Jonathan Franzen's terrible sex scenes, more insightful than Norman Mailer's terrible sex scenes, <laughs> and more incisive than John Updike's terrible sex scenes. <laughs> Basically, it's more valuable than any sex scene of any major 20th century male author. And the reason I can say this with such authority is because I too have felt the emotional roller coaster of Judgment Day as a kid. So the year was 1996. <laughs> and I was 14 and living at the time in Buenos Aires, Argentina with my parents, my 18 year old sister, and my 10 and 4 year old brothers. That night, my parents had gone out to a dinner party. Now I was doing whatever it is kids did before the internet. In which case, for me, that meant listening to Linger by the Cranberries yeah. as I wrote some yeah. poetry about my crush of the week. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it was supposed to be a whole fun evening until my sister hollered from across the apartment, Inez, you won't believe what's happening! So I rushed to the living room where my siblings were completely enthralled by the TV. A news report on one of the American channels was saying that there had been three meteor impacts around the world. One in Wyoming, another in France, the last one in China. And an expert guest spewed mathematical terminology to argue that these strikes had been deliberate. And a few minutes later, while we were watching this, news broke out that a larger meteor was on its way to Earth, and it was almost certain that complete and total destruction of our planet would occur. We sat there in stunned silence, because we were realizing that our fates had been sealed. All we had in the future was being young victims of a worldwide tragedy. My 
10-year-old brother was the first to speak. Should I go to church and confess? <laughs> <laughs> the news had finally achieved what years of Catholic school could not. <laughs> parents as villains in the period piece that was surely to be her life was actually upset at their absence. And as for me, I stared out into the busy Buenos Aires streets, feeling disappointed that I would never get to publish a book, or what's worse, have sex. <laughs> My youngest brother had already lost interest and was coloring, absorbed in his own blissful ignorance. We stayed glued to the TV. The more I stared, the more I realized there was something off. At first, I thought it was denial. I simply did not want to face my own death. But I was the kind of teenager whose mom had once comforted her by saying, oh, honey, we all die alone. <laughs> <laughs> and it actually made me feel better. <laughs> it was not my style to hope for the best. It was my style to question authority for the sake of questioning it. And part of it was your usual teenage angst, but part of it was the result of my life in Latin America. Argentina had, again, that year, claimed its spot in the top 10 list of most corrupt countries in the world. And my favorite show was called Gaia Que Gaia, which I can only describe as Argentina's predecessor to The Daily Show, except brutal, because Latin Americans don't even feign respect for elected officials. Yeah. <laughs> they believe in their right to be as ruthless as possible to those in power, because they already know that those in power will hurt them in ways that a nasty joke never could. News were absorbed with a critical eye, for you had no idea who had bought off who. And when it came to American news, our bullshit detector levels went way up, since the US had a history of denying much of the crimes they had committed in our region. And my brothers were too young to have home those skills. And my sister was the type of person who justified dropping out of college because her horoscope said it was time for a new beginning. <laughs> so Earth ending because of alien sent meteors fit her world future. <laughs> Plus, we all did agree that if it wasn't television, it might be true. But I began sniffing out crap. First off, how is it possible to get simultaneous translated subtitles if this was going on in real time? Second, why was no other channel showing this? And third, why did the reporter look exactly like the mom from Malcolm in the Middle? <laughs> <laughs> I searched for the relic that is now the TV guide and flipped over to the day's date and the programming under the channel number. And that's when I saw it was one of the lesser known movies in our super complete cable package that my dad had got. <laughs> and the title of what we were watching was called Without Warning, and the description fit exactly what was unfolding on the screen. <laughs> so I threw the magazine in my sister's face and burst into hysterical laughter. <laughs> we all felt foolish and spent the rest of what was clearly a fictional movie riffing over who was the most chicken. We marveled at the realistic effects it used to make it seem like a real report. And when my parents came back, we told them what happened. Turned out we weren't the only ones duped. One of the dinner party guests had received a tearful call from his adult daughter, ready to say goodbye. <laughs> and before I interpret this as some magical realism trait of Latin American thinking, there were several reports of panic in the States when this made-for-TV movie first aired. As human beings were pretty quick to believe in the end of days. Much like the kids in the story girl, though, we had no real change of hearts. My sister continued to feud with my parents until she got herself a great therapist. <laughs> Last time I talked religion with my brother, he declared the Catholic Church the most rancid institution in the world. <laughs> and my youngest continues to be adorably clueless. <laughs> As for me, I'm still hoping to get that book published. The virginity thing was taken care of a while ago, but does it all the urgency that an almost apocalypse should inspire? <laughs> <laughs> now, I'd like to think some of that will trigger an irreversible change in us, and we often sit around waiting for it. Sometimes we start making those transformations with renewed energy, only to put her out after a few months. We declare personal and political apocalypses, and revert back to our old selves when we see the sky still in place. Ellen Montgomery writes the following when the kids realize their mistake. We looked at each other, realizing what our dread had been, now that it was lifted. It was not the judgment day. The world and life were still before us, with all their potent mirror of years unknown. Now the way it's written, one can interpret the dread as having their lives cut short. But read another way, they might have been feeling dread about their unknown future, which for a brief moment had a clear ending. But now, with that option gone, comes the hard work of all those potent years that you must shake yourself. Thank you.